Hello, I'm Dr. Ken Lando. Thanks for watching. Let's talk about Avenity or Romozusumab. The drug was approved in April of 2019 for treatment of osteoporosis, but it's completely different from the standard medications. It has no relationship to the Fosamax or the Actinil or the Beneva or the Reclast or the Prolia. Those drugs are anti-resorptive. What they do is they prevent the breakdown or reduce the breakdown of bone, but they don't form bone. There are three medicines on the market right now that form bone, and Avenity is number one. And then we have uh, Forteo, and then we have another one called Timeless. Now, Avenity is the first sclerostin inhibitor that's approved by the Food and Drug Administration, but it's not for everybody. You have to be at very high risk in order to take the medicine, and it's for postmenopausal women who are at high risk for fracture, and the definition of high risk means they've already had an osteoporotic fracture, or they have multiple risk factors for fracture, or they're intolerant of the available therapies. The medicine is given by injection, received two injections at the same time, different sites, same time, once a month for 12 months. It's injected into the upper arm, upper thigh, or into the abdomen, but not right around the navel. It's not injected into tender skin, reddened skin, thickened skin, skin where there's an infection or a rash or a scar or a stretch mark, supposedly. It's to be injected by a healthcare practitioner. As I mentioned, you're only allowed to have 12 months worth of therapy, 12 months of consecutive therapy. But that doesn't cure osteoporosis. That can help treat it, but after the 12 months go by, you'd still need some kind of medicine, and that's when you have to go back and take either the Fosamax or Actinel or Reclast or Beneva or the Prolia so that you won't lose any of the benefit. Now, there's a problem. You see, in order to manufacture bone, you need some vitamin D, so we should check the vitamin D level. Simple blood tests can determine whether you have adequate amount. It has to be over 40 nanograms per milliliter. If it's less, then you get a shot of vitamin D, 50,000, 60,000 units is the suggested dose. And you have to check your calcium. Calcium has to be in the normal limits. Calcium cannot be below the lower limit of normal. Lower limit of normal is 8.3, 8.5 milligrams, depending on the laboratory. So the calcium has to be higher than that because during the first month of therapy, it's going to fall going to reach its lowest level by the end of the first month. So typically people take calcium supplements, 500, 600 milligrams a day. But there's a black box warning on the drug, and the black box warning says, hey, if you take this drug, you might have a heart attack, a stroke, or you might die from cardiovascular death. Mm, that ought to get your attention. It's not for people who have had a heart attack or a stroke within the year prior to starting therapy. And certainly, if you develop any symptoms consistent with heart attack or stroke while you're taking the medicine, you should stop. But then that means that there's a question. What happens if you're at risk for a heart attack or a stroke? What happens if you have high blood pressure, you have high cholesterol, you smoke cigarettes, you're overweight, you're obese, you have diabetes, or maybe you've had a stent or an angioplasty, or you have peripheral vascular disease, or maybe you have a family history of fracture? You have to very seriously weigh the risks versus the benefits. Yes, you have osteoporosis, but there's a chance that if we give you the drug, you're going to have a heart attack. So that's the, those are the factors that need to be considered. But there are other factors, too. So if you get the drug, you might have a hypersensitivity reaction. You might have swelling in your lip or your tongue, or you might develop a rash or hives or urticaria. And some people develop osteonecrosis of the jaw, the jaw, the mandible, the lower jaw. Well, parts of the bone can just die. It's spontaneous. Sometimes it's after a tooth extraction, or maybe you've had poor oral hygiene, maybe you develop an infection. Maybe you're receiving cancer chemotherapy, or you've had treatment with a different medicine for osteoporosis, or you're receiving some steroids. Fortunately, it's a relatively uncommon situation, but unfortunately, unfortunately, it does occur. And we can develop atypical femur fractures. So even though this is treatment for osteoporosis, while you're taking the medicine, all of a sudden you can break your thigh bone. And it can occur anywhere from your hip down to your knee. It's a low trauma fracture, low energy fracture. You didn't fall from a chair or something like that. You weren't on a ladder. But all of a sudden, just walking around, all of a sudden, 
your thigh bone breaks. And it can be bilateral, it can be on both sides. Oftentimes, for several weeks to a month or so before the fracture, you may develop some prodromal pain or achiness in your thigh or your hip or your groin. That's when you should go and see the doctor and find out if indeed you're at risk. Well, there's some other side effects too. Arthralgia pain in the joints, about one person in eight. Some headache and about 6% of the people. And then sometimes, pretty uncommonly though, but sometimes people could develop muscle spasms or neck pain or swelling of the leg or weakness or lack of energy or sometimes insomnia or paresthesias. But the issue is cardiovascular disease. First study that was done, very large study, didn't show any increase in the risk of cardiovascular disease. But the second study, again, a very large study, it showed that there was about an 87% increase compared to the placebo of cardiovascular problems that included a fourfold increase in the risk of heart attacks and a twofold increase in the risk of stroke and a risk of cardiovascular death that was increased by about 30%. Now, the numbers were really quite small but they did occur, and that's unsettling. Well, let's say you're going to get the medicine. Eh, it should be kept in the refrigerator, 36, 46 degrees, not in the freezer. It should be kept away from light. It can be kept at room temperature, if you're going on vacation or something like that, for up to a month. It should be inspected before it's used, make sure it's clear to opalescent, it's colorless to light yellow. There are no particles or no debris in the medicine itself. If you happen to have renal impairment or liver impairment, you can still receive the medicine. But sometimes if you have renal impairment, your calcium level is going to get relatively low, so you've got to pay attention to that. We always worry about women who are pregnant or breastfeeding or children. It's not an issue with this medicine because the age group for which it's intended is postmenopausal. It's a monoclonal antibody. It's a humanized monoclonal antibody, an IgG, a gamma globulin, that's grown in Chinese hamster ovary cell cultures. It's manufactured through DNA technology. The body, once you start receiving injections, sometimes makes its own antibodies to the antibody. And in that case, it can neutralize it and make the antibody not work very well. Well, where did sclerostin come from? Well, sclerostin's made in the body. But in 2001, they found some rare cases where people didn't really have sclerostin. The sclerostin didn't work. It had a loss of function mutation. Loss of function mutation in the gene, SOST. And they developed a disease. And the disease was called von Buchem disease or sclerostosis. And the people who had this condition, this rare condition, they developed thickened bones. The bone in the skull, and the bone in the arms, and the bone in the backbone, and the bone in the legs, all became relatively thick because the sclerostin wasn't working. Now, under normal circumstances, sclerostin is going to inhibit bone production, and it's going to increase the bone breakdown. That's typically what happens as we get older. But if the sclerostin doesn't work, then there's nothing to put the kibosh on the cells that manufacture the bone, and actually there is something that inhibits the bones, uh, the, the substances that break down the bones. So they developed an antibody or an inhibitor to the sclerostin so that could make us sort of like that disease and in effect give us better bones. Now most people think of the bone as structure, but actually the bone is an endocrine organ as well. And it manufactures a variety of substances of which the sclerostin is one and the fibroblast growth factor is another and the osteocalcin is another. And why is it important? Well, it's important because the osteo, I mean the sclerostin actually inhibits the vascular calcification. So you get some calcium in your blood vessels, you've heard about that, as you get the arteriosclerosis and all. Well, if we inhibit the inhibitor, that might lead to deposition of calcium in the arteries, and that's one of the suggestions for why cardiovascular disease might occur in people who are receiving the medicine, the avenity. So once you get the shots, 
it gets to the peak amount in the bloodstream in about five days. The half-life of the medicine is about 13 days, and it's eliminated just the same way as any of the body's immunoglobulins are, just broken down to peptides and amino acids. So the first large study looked at about 7,000 women, postmenopausal women, the average age was about 71, ranged anywhere between 55 and 90. They had osteoporosis on bone mineral density scans, and about 18%, or say one in five women, had a history of a vertebral fracture. Now, the women were divided into two groups. One group received the avenity, the other group received placebo for 12 months. In the second 12-month period, they received prolia, didn't receive the avenity anymore. They also received the calcium and the vitamin D. So what happened to the bones at 12 months? At 12 months, there was a reduction in the incidence of vertebral fractures. So the people getting a venity, about half of 1% had a vertebral fracture versus about 1.5% in the women who were receiving the placebo. If we look at the 24-month time frame, so now the women received the therapy, the avenity or the placebo for the first 12 months and the prolia for the second 12 months, and we look at the people, well, if they received the avenity originally, their likelihood of a fracture was only about, still, half of 1%, but now it was up to 2.5% in the women who received the placebo and then the prolia. Well, if we look at the second year of the study, it shows that unfortunately, yes indeed, there was a reduction in the incidence of vertebral fractures, but there wasn't a significant, a statistically significant decrease in the non-vertebral fractures, in other words, the hip and the wrist. It was only about 25% reduction, and that was not statistically different than with the placebo. On the other hand, some other studies had shown that people who received either the Forteo or the Timeless, they had about a 40 to a 53% reduction in the risk of non-vertebral fractures. Okay, so let's look at the women and see what the bone mineral density does. Bone mineral density actually increased quite a bit. After first year, it was an increase of about 13%. If we look at the lumbar spine, and if we look at the hip or we look at the femoral neck, we find that it's about a 5% increase. So that's pretty good. And even while they stopped the therapy for the second year, still maintained. So that's good. That's good news. Then they did the second study. Should never do a second study. So they did the second study, the second study called ARCH. It was done in 125 centers in 40 countries, and countries including Russia and Guatemala and Bulgaria and Romania and Colombia and the Dominican Republic, in addition to the United States and England and Canada and Germany and France. The study was performed. It was designed by the drug company, actually two drug companies, UCB, which is the Union Camique Belge out of Belgium and Amgen out of Thousand Oaks, California. They designed the study. They actually wrote the study. So we have to think that all of the possible benefits would be there. But what did the study show? Well, first of all, it evaluated women who were at very high risk for osteoporotic fractures. These women 99% of them already had at least one fracture after they were 45, 96% of them fracture of their vertebrae. These women received either the Avenity or they received the Fosamax, which is a Lendronate. So they received that for the first year. And then everybody in the second year received the Lendronate. Nobody received the Avenity anymore. And they evaluated what happened. Now, all the women had osteoporosis, obviously. They had significant risk factors. And at the end of 12 months, they found in this high-risk group that 3% had a major osteoporotic fracture. And if we look at the group receiving the Fosamax, a little more than 4% had an osteoporotic fracture. Well, that was an important difference. It's 1.2% absolute, and it was about 28% on a relative 
reduction, but it wasn't statistically significant. And if we look at the fracture of the hips at the end of the first year, it was a smidgen of difference, again, favoring the avenity over the Fosamax or the Alendronate, but it wasn't statistically significant. And same thing with the non-vertebral fractures. Wasn't statistically significant, but it was there in favor of the avenity. So that's all very important. But the major benefits occurred at the end of the second year or the end of the study, end of the primary analysis period, that was really about 33 months. So in the women who received initially the avenity and then the alendronate, compared to the women who received just the alendronate, there were major differences. The differences in major osteoporotic fractures in the women who originally received the avenity, 7% of them had fractures, versus 10% in the group receiving the alendronate or Fosamax, if we look at the hip fractures, 2% versus a little more than 3%. If we look at non-vertebral fractures, a little less than 9% versus about 10.5%. So overall, a significant reduction in the rate of fractures, vertebral and non-vertebral, after the second year or at the end of the primary analysis period. And, of course, the bone mineral density was indeed increased, increased by about the same token that it was in the first study. But the problem is that in the second study, that's where the cardiovascular reactions occurred. So if you look at serious cardiovascular adverse effects in the group receiving the Fosamax, it was a little less than 2% versus about 2.5%. That's a, in the Venity group, that's a 31% increase. It wasn't statistically significant, but the cardiac ischemic event rate, that increased by about 2.5 fold, and the cerebrovascular adverse event rate increased by about two and a quarter fold and they did another study and they looked at men who were osteoporotic called the bridge study they looked at 245 men and they gave them the avenity for a year and indeed it increased the risk of adverse cardiovascular events from two in the placebo group to four in the uh, to eight in the avenity group that was a fourfold increase. Well, that caused some worry at the FDA. That's why we have the black box warning. The drug company also was thinking that maybe this would help heal fractures. So they did a study, but they discontinued the study early because it didn't seem to work. And just parenthetically, it seems that women who receive the standard kind of anti-resorptive therapy, the Fosamax, the Beneva, and all, and then receive the avenity, maybe the avenity doesn't quite work as well. Now, they talk about how much money it takes to develop a drug, and that's why we have to have the very high prices. But as with so many other drugs, this one, even though it's put out by Amgen, wasn't discovered by Amgen at all. They bought the rights. So it was invented or discovered by some folks at Cairo Science. That was in the years before 1999, actually in 1999, Cairo Science was bought up by Celtech, and Celtech made an arrangement with Amgen to go and develop the drug. Then Celtech was acquired by UCB. So then we have all of the stories about how the drug came to be, but the important thing is that the patent extends until 2026, so we're going to have a high-priced drug that has some risk factors associated with it. Now, interestingly enough, they first presented the biologic license uh, application to the Food and Drug Administration in July of 2016. They say, well, you want to market this for women with osteoporosis. July 2017, the next year, almost to the day, the Food and Drug Administration issued a complete response letter and said, eh, let's put a halt on that and why don't you submit the study to the one that had the heart related issues, why don't you submit the data from that to us and we'd like to see the bridge study with the men where you also have the cardiovascular problems. Well, finally they got approval, as I said, in 2019 and they were looking around for a price. How much should we charge for the drug? That's disconcerting. 
So they decided that they should charge about what the timeless costs. And the timeless costs about $1,800 a month. So the people at Amgen said, OK, we'll charge about $1,800 a month. And indeed, the wholesale cost is going to be $1,825 a month, or $22,000 a year. If you were to buy it yourself, say through Blink Health, most of it is sold by specialty pharmacies, not through the regular drugstores. But if you were to buy it, say, through Blink Health, which is one of those mail order places that's legit, you could get it for about $1,900 or $23,000. Now, timeless, as I said, is about $1,800, $1,900 a month. Forteo, Forteo is about $3,400 a month. It's made by Eli Lilly. Eli Lilly also makes a lot of insulin. And you know what's happening to the price of insulin? Well, it's the same thing that's happened to the price of Forteo. They keep raising the price. They've raised the price twice a year for the past six years. And as a matter of fact, if we look over the past 15 years, they've raised the price 400%. And they've raised the price just since 2010 by about 300%. They're rapidly increasing the price because pretty soon they're going to lose the patent protection and then people are going to make knockoffs or make what we call biosimilars and it's not going to be the cash cow for the company. Now the other option is a drug called Prolia. Prolia is given by an injection and it's every six months and the cost of that is about $1,200 to $1,300 a shot. So here we have a new drug. We have a new drug, it's expensive, it can only be taken for a year, and it has a significant risk for cardiovascular disease that we worry about. So it's not for people who have recent history of heart disease or stroke. We have to worry about whether a person has significant risk factors. The company originally wanted approval for all postmenopausal women, but the Food and Drug Administration turned them down. And they said, after further evaluation, we want it only for women who are at high risk and for women who don't have any cardiovascular disease and we're going to put the black box warning on. So now we have three drugs that help build up the bone. We have a vanity, and then we have Forteo where the price is going crazy. And then we have a relatively new entry. It was approved in 2017, it's timeless and that acts like the parathyroid hormone. And then we have all of the others, and all of the other drugs are anti-resorptive medicines. They don't actually stimulate new bone production. Now, it gets confusing because they might increase the bone density a little bit, but they increase the bone density, not because they make new bone, but because they take some calcium and they deposit it in the bone so we can get a hypermineralization state where you think you're actually improved, but you might not be. So if you want to learn more about osteoporosis and some of the drugs used for osteoporosis, we have some shows on appropriate drugs. You can watch them. Let us know what you think. Anyway, thanks for watching. I'm Dr. Ken Landau. Thank you.